the national policy to have preserved for public use historical and prehistorical sites, buildings, and objects of national significance for the inspiration and benefit of the people of the United States. Modern highways mean progress, vastly increased convenience, safety, and economy for millions of motorists, and the movement of great quantities of goods. Road construction moves rapidly ahead to open up the sweeping freeways of the great interstate system, and to improve lesser roads as well. Road building spells progress. It can also spell destruction. Destruction of the records of those who lived before us. For the archaeologist, this place could have added to the knowledge of prehistoric life. Here was a dwelling inhabited nine centuries ago, half destroyed by an old road that cut through what looks like an ordinary mound of earth. This is what the archaeologist calls a site. It is part of an early type of building, a pit house built under the ground and roofed over. Indian boys passing every day have never suspected that here is an ancient home. This is a pit house floor. And here is part of its wall. This site would have yielded records of early Indians of the southwestern United States. Not written records, but relics that tell a vivid story. Stone points for darts or arrowheads. Skeletal remains that offer a picture of those early people. The ornaments they fashioned of shell traded in from the west coast of native turquoise and bone. Pottery they made for cooking and food storage. The material, the form and design telling from what culture the craftsmen came. These and remnants of food, tools, gaming pieces, and the paraphernalia of religious rites. These are the materials that write the history of prehistoric man. From the yield of scores of sites, the background of the modern Indian slowly emerges. This 11th century, half-destroyed site lies on Tasuki Indian land. It is only a short distance from a modern Pueblo, one of 19 in New Mexico. Despite inroads of the white man's culture, today's Pueblo Indians have many ties with their distant past. Evidences appear in adaptations of an earlier dress and techniques of pottery making. The plan of houses surrounding a central plaza, 
building materials and methods of building, kivas and ceremonial dances all have their roots in past centuries. W.J. Keller, division engineer for the Bureau of Public Roads, is an amateur archaeologist. In 1954, he watched road building destroy a rich site. He felt a program must be developed to preserve valuable records from loss through highway construction. In barest outline, the program would mean identifying sites before road construction started. It would mean modifying the classic methods of the archaeologist. It would require the use of mechanized equipment, all the new techniques of salvage archaeology. It meant studying federal and state statutes on the preservation of American antiquities and working out partial reimbursement of costs from road funds. Keller visualized a three-way partnership, the Bureau of Public Roads, the State Highway Department, and the Museum of New Mexico. The resulting program has paid high dividends. Because of the excellent working relationships developed among the three agencies, the Museum of New Mexico has recovered thousands of items during seven years of operations at 89 sites. Operations carried out in the vanguard of Bulldozer and Blade. More important to the nation, a federal law was enacted in 1956 authorizing the use of road funds for archaeological salvage. And the Bureau of Public Roads issued a uniform policy and procedure for all the states. Accomplishments of the program are now reviewed by retiring division engineer Keller for the benefit of his successor, Harold W. Adkison. He is assured that good relationships have continued between federal and state highway agencies and the museum. Deeply interested in the program are T.B. White, Chief Highway Engineer, and Dr. K. Ross Toole, Director of the Museum of New Mexico. Dr. Fred Wendorf, director of the Laboratory of Anthropology, a unit of the State Museum, is responsible for the salvage program. He points out that 14 sites were on road projects supervised by the Federal Bureau of Public Roads. The great majority, 71, were on state highway department projects. Two were on U.S. Forest Service roads and two on Indian Service roads. Museum personnel must coordinate archaeological salvage with the highway program. A new road is the culmination of more than a hundred operations, including processing quantities of traffic statistics and data on road condition ratings. Selection of projects for construction based on ratings of critical condition study of the many factors that determine a route's alignment, including the work of location crews and economic analyses to derive costs, property checks and appraisals, and negotiations with property owners to acquire rights of way. The design of the road, its bridges and other structures, and finally, all phases of construction. Many of these operations are of no concern to the salvage archaeologist. But road design is of vital importance. 
James B. Sassenti, a staff member of the Laboratory of Anthropology, assigned full-time to the highway salvage program, is a frequent visitor in the department's road design section. He confers with the coordinator of road plans and specifications. They first check the schedule of road projects that will be let to contract in the coming months. This project is reaching the final phases of design. The title sheet gives its exact location. Many parts of the plans have no bearing on salvage. The plan and profile sheets are the key. The archaeologist is trained to interpret these plans and profile sheets as competently as a highway engineer. Other pertinent sheets deal with the location, size, and character of pits from which road building materials will be taken. These pits are often at some distance from the construction location. Projects that are in much earlier phases of design are also examined. An interesting note appeared on the field roll sent in by a location crew. The archaeologist will investigate this possible Indian camp site. A project that is now ready for letting to contract will have an archaeological survey. The archaeologist is already familiar with the project and will use the reduced plans for his survey. Using the plans as a guide, the archaeologist examines the land to be occupied by the future road and the entire right-of-way area. The highway archaeologist is trained to relate road plans to the actual terrain and to make accurate locations. No reimbursement from road funds is made for excavation beyond the right-of-way. The archaeologist concentrates on detecting evidences of human occupation. This wall proves to be part of an ancient Pueblo. It is an unusual find being situated on low ground. Prehistoric villages were almost always built on high ground to avoid periodic floods and to conserve farmland. As the survey progresses, costs of a dig are considered, the number of laborers and man hours required, and whether power equipment will be needed. The archaeologist thinks always in terms of the fewest men, the least equipment, the shortest time for scientifically valid results. Surface materials gathered from trash mounds near dwellings, will be studied later and more carefully in the laboratory. Notes on sites describe type of fill, size and condition, period and culture. All preliminary survey reports include photographs. Each site, large or small, discovered in the area of the road project is fully documented. All evidence is weighed, and the cost of a dig is estimated. Not all sites are discovered by professional archaeologists. Long before the archaeologist learns of new road construction, highway department location engineers have been at work. Some of the richest sites were discovered while these men were on preliminary reconnaissance of alignments for new roads. From the beginning of the salvage program, location engineers have been alerted to watch for possible sites. 
This one quickly recognizes something of significance. Here is clear evidence of early structures. He realizes too that a stone ax is not often found on the surface. Engineers follow the Bureau recommendation to avoid lines that destroy archaeological sites when feasible. On flat lands, it is easier to shift lines than in rugged terrain. Assignments for road locations vary. Sometimes a line is to follow an old road. Sometimes the road alignment must be determined in the field according to terrain. And on occasion, several lines must be run for comparison. The alignment for a portion of a new interstate route has been decided and the center line is being staked. Taking cross sections at all stations on the center line sends men a hundred feet and often much farther to each side of the line. Seasoned members of location parties, as well as the party chief, are versed in watching for and recognizing signs of treasure. Records will be made of these stone points and sherds, fragments of pottery. Gathering data for drainage structures often reveals archaeological evidence, but almost invariably, this lies outside the right-of-way. In the course of recording topography, all features, including archaeological and historical remains, are noted. Cultural information is entered in field books then transferred to location roles from which the design engineers will work. On rare occasions, sites go undiscovered until the contractor has brought in his equipment and road building is underway. Here, during construction, pot sherds have been found. In such a situation, the highway department project engineer alerts the archaeologist, who comes as soon as possible. The most important single factor in the success of a salvage program is timing archaeological excavations so as not to interrupt the main business, road building. Robert E. Miller, spokesman for the Associated Contractors of New Mexico, assures highway and museum officials that there have been no complaints from contractors over delays. The contractors were pleased to finance a publication in 1958, setting forth bureau policies on archaeological salvage and guides to cooperation agencies. This informational guide has been very helpful in other states where similar programs have been contemplated. The contractor agrees that the work schedule can be arranged to avoid disturbing the site until a dig is finished. The contractor, 
project engineer, understand there are a number of reasons a site can go undiscovered until after construction begins. In some places, amateur or professional archaeologists have gleaned all the pot sherds and other surface materials. Sand dunes can cover sites completely. The archaeologist may have been busy on another dig and not available to make a preliminary survey. If the contractor is unable to spare his workers for the unexpected dig, the project engineer will hire local men. A small site lies beyond the right of way. Although it is not eligible for excavation, its existence will be recorded. To reduce the inconvenience and costs of present archaeological surveys done before construction, the museum is making a systematic inventory of cultural evidence on main roads. This research project is reviewed periodically by the department's planning director and Bureau of Public Roads representatives from the regional and division offices. The department's three-year contract with the museum calls for a cultural inventory of all rural interstate routes, all rural primary routes, and certain major secondary roads. About three-fourths of the cost of the study will be met from federal planning and research funds and the rest from state funds. The inventory has already eliminated the need for several preliminary archaeological surveys on recent road projects, the fieldwork having been completed on several routes. The museum employs two archaeologists working as a team to conduct the inventory. Observations are made from the car until terrain is spotted that looks archaeologically promising. Careful study of large areas with field glasses speeds the process. Territory to 1,000 feet on each side of the roadway is scouted. Museum records show a mission ruin near the old Spanish town of Abacu. The archaeologists find that the mission is located on a much earlier Indian Pueblo. Rewarding trash is found at the great majority of sites worth digging. Although some sites will be missed, they will not be major ones. Estimates are made of the time and equipment needed for a dig. And all standard procedures for an archaeological survey are followed. A knowledge of Spanish is helpful in some parts of the state, as local residents are questioned on the existence of archaeological ruins and historic buildings. This is Manuelito in Navajo country, an area of many and rich sites. To the knowing eye, it is a panorama of the living and dying of people over 10 long centuries. This depression, a pit house, marks a beginning. Later, man inhabited this hill, a Pueblo village, for over 400 years. And today, a modern Navajo Hogan stands nearby. 
Interstate Route 40 is destined to traverse the area of these large sites. Soon, giant machines will plow their way through them to build a modern freeway. But first will come weeks of intensive work to uncover as much as possible. And to remove as much as possible before destruction from road building. The placement of a new highway is not capricious. Serious discussions precede the choice of a new route. The location engineer explains the terrain and man-made developments along several possible alignments. At Manuelito, there are numerous problems. There is a river that cannot be ignored. The Rio Puerco of the West. The main line of the Santa Fe Railroad occupies much of the land between the river and the cliffs to the north. Then there are the cliffs themselves, skirted by US 66. Four possible lines for the new interstate route have been run and thoroughly analyzed. A Bureau of Public Roads engineer asks about the one farthest to the north. The north line would simplify design and construction by avoiding this tight spot completely. The department's planning director quotes figures showing that the longer northern route would cost road users $700,000 more each year in vehicle operating costs than the route south of the river. then why not follow more or less US 66, line B or C, and cut away the cliffs? The road design engineer answers that such an operation would add a million dollars to engineering and construction costs. And so the discussion continues, weighing access and right-of-way costs that must be heated, construction and maintenance costs, and costs to road users. From this and later meetings, a decision is made. The road will follow line A through the valley to the south of the river and railroad tracks. Sites at Manuelito will be destroyed, but for the salvage archaeologist, this is not an unhappy experience. The highway salvage program, with more than half the expenses coming from road building funds, makes possible a great accumulation of information that would otherwise be lost. As the Navajo crew works on surface stripping, their actions reflect the knowledge and experience gained in previous archaeological salvage on their reservation. But long before this crew was hired, the legal right to excavate had to be obtained. The United States Code outlines general procedures. In New Mexico, it is the museum that obtains permissions to excavate from public agencies, tribes, and pueblos. Negotiations for both road construction and archaeological digs on Navajo land rest with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and tribal officials. Paul Jones, Navajo Tribal Council Chairman, reviews Highway Department road plans with a staff member of the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Tribal Land Officer. If a problem of road location arises, it may be referred to the Advisory Board or the entire Council, representing 90,000 Navajos. The Tribe grants only the right to construct with Bureau of Indian Affairs approval. 
even after a road is built. The highway department has surface easement only. The museum must obtain permission to excavate the site. Road building and archaeological work on Pueblo lands are handled in a similar way. The highway department has easement for a new road near San Fidel, passing through the Ocama Pueblo grant, and the museum has secured permission to excavate. When the highway department buys property from a private owner, no permission is needed. Museum personnel move in and dig. The digs at Manuelito and here at San Fidel are the largest yet undertaken for the highway salvage program. The several sites at each location will require six to eight weeks to excavate. A former highway salvage archaeologist has been assigned to the San Fidel job. Because of the road construction schedule, the work here and at Manuelito must be done at the same time. The archaeologist has hired a crew of Okama Indians. Small sites require only a day or two of field work and cost less than $200. The digs at San Fidel and Manuelito will come to some $8,000 each. The costs of the majority of excavations fall within these extremes. The archaeologist in charge of a salvage operation must organize and direct numerous and varied activities. Surface materials must be gathered from each site. An area is marked for excavation. Then surface stripping begins. As the dig continues, work progresses on a pit house at one of the sites. Structural features are discovered. The walls of a surface storage room emerge. An outdoor fireplace is uncovered. In one of the pit houses, a pottery bowl comes to light. A mono for grinding corn is found. And the entire pit house is cleared. The discovery of well-preserved roof beams is fortunate. Tree rings afford one means of dating the occupation of a dwelling. Placing a site in its archaeological period is essential. This small site dates from the earliest period at Manuelito. Excavation will uncover one pit house, two surface storage rooms, and outdoor fireplaces. It is a one-family dwelling with no sign of later habitation. The second of the three sites to be excavated at Manuelito is the latest, with two periods of occupancy. First structures to be exposed date from about 1150 and include a kiva and as yet unexplained slab platforms. The platforms rested on a vertical rock fill. Removing the fill revealed floors and fireplaces. The four rooms were built a century or so before the second occupation. The largest site bridges the end of the pit house era and the beginning of the first Pueblo period. 
This one site will prove to have 11 pit houses and 15 surface rooms. Field observations indicate that the occupants were influenced by two separate cultures. Soil samples are taken routinely. Chemical analyses indicate the type of vegetation at the time of occupation and subsequent changes in environment. Four of the pit houses at Manuelito had burned while still occupied and the roof beams had fallen in. Apparently, the inhabitants made no attempt to recover their possessions. From these houses come the best preserved artifacts. Despite the pressure of limited time in salvage archaeology, artifacts are removed with great care. Items recovered are meticulously recorded in the field. These include skeletal remains of animals as well as all artifacts. The position of each item is noted on the surface, in the fill, or on the floor. Record keeping is as important as the recovery of materials. Burial offerings yield archaeological treasure. Food bowls, matates, and monos, or stone blades, may be found. There may be bracelets necklaces and pendants, or only a few potsherds. Skeletal remains afford a wealth of information about the inhabitants, their stature and appearance, the diseases and accidents from which they suffered. Thirty burials will have been found by the end of the dig at Manuelito. A detailed record is completed on each burial. For pit house excavations, power equipment is brought in when time is pressing. A backhoe and dump truck are standard equipment. This young Spanish-American is a skilled operator. Because of intensive training on archaeological work, he controls his machine so expertly and reacts so sensitively that there is virtually no damage to artifacts. The existence of a pit house, 
is verified by test holes. Depending on circumstances, the test holes are dug by the crew or by the backhoe. Cross trenches are dug to define the limits of the pit house. Then fill is removed as close as possible to the bench and wall. To direct the backhoe properly, the archaeologist must know its capacities and limitations as thoroughly as the operator. A crew of six as hard-working and knowledgeable as these Navajos can clear one pit house as rapidly as the backhoe and at less cost. But in Manuelito there are 12 pit houses to be excavated. Work is speeded by integrating the operations of crew and backhoe. In the excavation process there are many different jobs for the crew at the several sites. An abandoned Hogan serves as camp headquarters. During a long dig, recovered materials are processed in the field. And when an excavation lasts for some weeks, the archaeologist's family can be with him. As many items as possible are given field catalog numbers. Every article must be labeled, stone pipes and ornaments, effigies and bone awls. When work at the site is over for the day, Restoration of artifacts can be done at the camp to save time later in the laboratory. Mapping is an essential part of documentation. Every vestige of the sites here will disappear in the path of the new freeway. Field workers must be prepared for anything. The mud following heavy snows finally forces suspension of operations for two weeks, bogs down equipment, and isolates the camp. But work continues. Detailed records are kept in the field. When possible, 
Copies of reports are mailed back to the laboratory as a precaution against loss. After a dig is completed, a comprehensive technical report is written based on the voluminous field records and further study of the artifact. The report, printed by the highway department, makes the information available to the scientific world. All objects recovered from highway salvage are added to the museum's large archaeological collection available to scholars for research. From this reservoir, objects are drawn for exhibition. The exhibit in the highway department lobby is devoted entirely to highway salvage and changed from time to time by museum archaeologists and artists. Knowledge accumulates slowly in all scientific fields. As archaeological excavations continue, more and more details are added. From knowledge comes an appreciation of the life and the habits, the interests, and the artistry of prehistoric people. This exhibit presents a vivid picture of the past, lends perspective to the present and the future for the inspiration and benefit of the people of the United States.